went to that doctor. He says, Doc, I, I can't see well anymore these days. So the doctor fixes him up with a pair of glasses and tells him to come back in two weeks. Two weeks later, he comes in. The doc says, well, how are you doing? He says, I'm depressed. And the doc says, what's the problem? Didn't the glasses help you? And he says, the glasses are fine. But I just discovered I've been living with a water hose the past two years. That is funny, by the way. <laughs> You're allowed to laugh. Exodus chapter 7, 10 to 13 says, So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Would you bow your heads with me, dear Lord? We thank you this morning for the opportunity we have to break this bread, which is your word, to consume it together and to be blessed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title of our sermon today is Sticks and Snakes. Most people get to willies if they see a snake, except people that love snakes. I don't know anybody like that. I have photographed a few seniors, though, that brought snakes with them. Was it, I had one kid who had a snake wrapped around his neck and stuff, you know. And I have a, I've had a couple of girls, not too many, overall of thousands of people. And there could be 50,000 that I photographed, I think, near as I can guess. Only two or three had snakes with them. But this was no ordinary snake. In King James, it's a serpent. In the NIV, it's a snake. The Hebrew word tanin is not an ordinary snake. The Hebrew word nahash is, a, is translated as a serpent or as a snake on the tree in the garden of Eden, of Genesis, chapter 3. Nahash is also translated serpent or snake in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 3. Tanin often translated as a dragon or a sea monster or a serpent. Maybe it looked like a crocodile. There were crocodiles in the Nile. A crocodile is a serpent and, uh, and, and, and so is a snake a serpent. But whatever it was, it was a miracle of God. It was one of a kind. Both the one in the tree, in the garden, and the one that, Mo that became a snake when Aaron threw his staff down, and Moses, of course, did the same thing. But the Nahash of Exodus chapter 4 was one of a kind, too. And uh, it says, it's in chapter 4, verse 2 to 4, Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, Throw it to the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and became a snake, and he ran from it. Curious to me um, why he ran away from that snake. Continuing, then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out his hand and took a hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. So if the Nahash was an ordinary serpent or snake, why did Moses run away from it? Moses was a shepherd for 40 years in Midian in the desert. Don't tell me he hadn't seen any snakes, along with other threatening critters. Probably seen scorpions and who knows what all kind of threatening things. But he ran away from this snake. It wasn't an ordinary snake. It was fearsome and threatening. And it was from God. God caused that stick to turn into a snake. So it was a miracle. The Nahash that tempted Eve in the garden wasn't or an ordinary snake either. When you have, a, have you seen a talking snake? That one was from Satan. A talking snake. They weren't ordinary serpents. Continuing in Exodus chapter 7, verse 11, Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same thing by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. The satanic serpents 
whatever they were, were no match for the tenin that Aaron's staff became because it swallowed them up. It was a creature that's translated as a serpent. We don't know what it looked like, but it was able to swallow up all the serpents of the magicians. So Aaron's staff, like the staff of Moses, was just an ordinary stick. I used to have a, a hiking stick that I made out of a cherry sapling, so the bark on it. And it, it was just a staff from wood. The shepherds would make their staff, and they're depicted sometimes with a curved top. And I don't know how they would make that curved top because they didn't have steam bending back then like we do today, but it's pictured that way. But it was just wood. They would, you know, have a branch of a tree that they thought that wood was best, you know, longest and, and would last, and they would carve that down into a staff. They used it to prod their uh, sheep and goats and uh, to fend off enemy things. But uh, in verse 13 it said, Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard and would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. So God was in control there. God had a plan. He always has a plan. Moses' staff was called the staff of God after this encounter with the burning bush. His, stone, his staff was called the staff of God. So here we have a calling. In 2 Timothy 1.9 it says, He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Moses was a fugitive. He was a shepherd. He herded his father-in-law's sheep. He most likely learned sheep herding from Jethro, his father-in-law, who was a priest of Midian. I don't exactly know what that means. I don't exactly know. Or he might have learned it from his wife because she was Jethro's daughter and she was an experienced sheep herder. So he had no degrees, no credentials. He was just an ordinary guy, ordinary man. He was familiar with the ways of Egypt because he grew up there. He was familiar with the ways of Midian because he toiled there for 40 years following the flocks of sheep. He had no learning, no expertise in leading people. So then, why did God call Moses, of all people, to confront the Pharaoh, the most powerful person on that part of the world? Well, God knew that Moses would do it. Amen? Moses resisted at first, but God knew that he would do it. God knows what's going to happen and who's going to do what. And I mean, I resisted being a minister. But God knew I would do it. And so who confronted the Pharaoh? Who confronted Pharaoh? Who led the, the Hebrews out of bondage? God did it. Moses was the instrument God used to do that. Who turned sticks into serpents? God did. Who turned the magician's sticks into serpents? Satan did. God's work is always more powerful than Satan's. That would have been a good place for an amen right there. Satan's work is inferior to God's. <laughs> And then we have the following, Deuteronomy 5.33. Walk in obedience to all that the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. This was later spoken to the Israelites after the Ten Commandments had been given. This directive, now given to the whole community, is the way of life for Moses after he encountered God. Things 
weren't only always easy for Moses. This was a hard thing that he did. But except for when he smote the rock instead of speaking to the rock, he always did his best to do what God instructed him. Except for that one incident, he always obeyed. The following is obedience. If you're a follower, you obey the one you're following. Following God is being subject to His will and His ways. It's obedience. Then we have a struggle. Pharaoh thought that he was a God. He kept refusing to let the people go, which was part of God's plan. Hardship came to the Egyptians because of Pharaoh's stubborn heart. No matter the plague, he would not humble himself until the death of the firstborn. Death would not strike the Israelites because of the lamb's blood that was applied to the sides and the tops of their door frames, which they did in obedience to God's directive. The Israelites had to obey the directives that God gave Moses. But there was nothing that the Egyptians could do to save their firstborn. Not a thing in their power, not a thing by the magicians, not a thing by the authority of Pharaoh could withstand the hand of God. Then the victory. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 4 verses, when you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and a great greater army than yours, do not be afraid of them, because the Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt, will be with you. When you're about to go into battle, the priest shall come forth and address the army. He shall say, Here, Israel, today you are going into battle against your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not panic or be terrified by them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. Of course, all that was a hinged on obedience to God's word and God's will. Amen. The staff of Moses called the staff of God after that incident with the burning bush. And the staff of, of Aaron, they were shepherd's staffs. You might call them walking sticks. I tried to find that one that I made. I couldn't find it. I was going to bring it and, uh, and lean on it. <laughs> But I couldn't find it. They were just ordinary, everyday wooden sticks. Moses was just an ordinary shepherd. Nothing special about him, especially in his own eyes. He was a curious man. That's why he turned aside to investigate the burning bush. Pharaoh was a smug arrogant, ungodly man. We see a lot of those today. Thinking he was a god. No one could get him to relent. No one could get him to ever change his mind or attitude about anything. Except with that last plague of the death of the firstborn. He had complete, unquestioned authority about everything in Egypt. He thought that no one could oppose him. He considered himself to be a god. Our god, Yahweh, which comes to us as Jehovah, had the real, complete authority over everything on earth. But he, humil but he humiliated the ruling authority, which was Pharaoh, in order to bring glory and honor to himself. And Pharaoh was humiliated because even his own firstborn was killed in that place. The cry of God's people in Egypt resulted in the Exodus. Chapter 3 of Exodus, verse 7, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. 
I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Jesus came along, and though he was God, he lived an ordinary life as a carpenter. He was what we would consider a blue-collar worker. Like Moses, he wasn't a part of the ruling elite. He wasn't part of the religious elite. The Israelites were in a dark place. They were enslaved without hope. They were under the cruel thumb of Pharaoh and the ruling elites of the time. God used Moses, a humble but willing man, to bring them out of bondage. Moses had a stick, and God used the stick, too. Jesus used a stick, a piece of wood, the cross, to bring everyone out of darkness of sin. He brought us out of the bondage of sin on the cross, a piece of wood. Just like the stick was a piece of wood. This nation and the rest of the world is increasingly in darkness. Except for the few that are born again who have come to Christ, the rest of the world is in the bondage of sin. Sinfulness that totally insults God. Our own nation embraces executing unborn babies, innocent unborn babies, when there are couples that would love to adopt them. And God said, do not kill. There are centers that support unwed mothers, support them, provide adoption service if needed, if they, if they don't want to keep those. There are centers around. And Elizabeth Warren said, we have to put a stop to those. And I heard another politician say the same thing. Another lefty. They want the babies dead. What else could you conclude when they say we have to put a stop to those birthing centers that are trying to help our men run with mothers? They want the babies dead. And God said, do not kill this new gender business inflicted on school children is child abuse. Genesis 1.27, so God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. If you have two X chromosomes, you're female. No matter what you do to your body, you're still female. If you have X and a Y chromosome, you're male. You can mutilate yourself, change your name, wear women's clothes, you're still male. You can't just think yourself into another gender. That's ridiculous. You can't just declare that you're a different gender than the one you are born with. Doing that insults God. Homosexuality, Leviticus 18.22. Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. 1 Corinthians 6.9. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, or idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men. Romans 1, 26 to 27. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also, men also abandoned their natural re relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Scripture speaks for itself. Those are three verses. There are places where pastors go to jail for preaching biblical standard of marriage. Canada is one of them. I think there's European parts.
places to it. Homosexuality is offensive to God and it should be detestable to us. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by flaunting themselves in their practices against God. In uh, our own country and others, homosexuality and gay marriage are celebrated and speaking against it is renounced. It's upside down. Evil is celebrated. We're in a place where man is God. Men consider themselves over God in those things. Man deciding what is good and what is not. We're in darkness. This diversity, equity, and inclusion you hear about all the time. Diversity is about the alphabet, L, L G, whatever, I don't want to say the whole thing. You know what I'm talking about, the alphabet people. That's diversity. And all of that is evil, but it's becoming sacred to the left. They promote that like it's a religion. The, the, the diversity is, that's what diversity is. Equal equity is Marxism. They say diversity, equity, inclusion. The equity is Marxism. We should all have the same things. Marxism, socialism, and communism all hate God. We should all have the same access to goods and services, whether we earn it or not. Everybody should have the same level of equity. Exodus 20 and verse 17, you said, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What's coveting? It's just a jealous longing for what somebody else has. And that's at the heart of this equity business. Gender equity and inclusion. Inclusion. I'm happy to welcome everyone, even sinners, but I draw the line at welcoming sin. Romans 1, 28-32. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do what not ought what ought, what not what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers. God haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. That's what inclusion is. No, we don't approve. But our society has involved into approving all kinds of evil and coddling those who do such things. Gay pastors, gay bishops openly. Even the Pope has condoned gay marriage. A couple months ago, or not too long ago, Globalism. The globalists are using the so-called climate crisis, which is a cult, to precipitate a move to usurp the sovereignty of nations. I don't want my country that I love to be subject to laws and regulations that come from an offshore entity. But that's what globalists want, a one-world system. It sounds like the beast to me. Genesis 22, 18. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. That was spoken to Abraham. Nations, plural. Not one nation, but the way God set things up, there were nations. People everywhere would be able to be saved through faith in the Messiah. 
the beast of the Antichrist will try to control the whole world. Maybe the globalists are trying to lay the groundwork for that. I think that Satan uses globalism to advance his agenda. The real one world will be under Jesus. I'm not interested in any globalist, anything, until Jesus comes. His one, in his world there will be no murderers, no smash and grab thieves, no Marxists, no alphabet people, no gender benders, and no one worlders who worshiped at the altar of globalism. living in a world and in a country that's getting darker and darker. The modern sinful practices that we see happening around us remind me of Egypt. A man thought that he was God. Now we're seeing mankind thinking that man is in the place of God. I would call that bondage. Is there any light? Yes, the light is only for those who will see it. The rest will stay in the dark that they have created. The ones who will see the light are those who embrace the Lord Jesus. As Lord and Savior, the light is on our side. Darkness is on the world's side. They don't believe because they refuse to believe. Exodus 14, 19 and 22. This is when they're about to move uh, across the Red Sea. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side. Picture that now. So neither went near the other all night long. So then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on the right and on the their left. God's holy light was on the Israelites and the darkness was on the Pharaoh's army. The light was on the Israelites because they were in God's will. And the darkness was on the Pharaoh's side. There was a pillar, a cloud, and a bright light. A light. But this world now is on the wrong side of God. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Amen? Because we belong to God, we are targets of the enemy. We have battles. We have weapons. Moses had a stick, and God used the stick. We have something more powerful than a stick. We have something more powerful than that. We have the Holy Spirit. We have access to divine power through the Holy Spirit. How many have ever seen a miracle? I think we will. If you're born again, you were a miracle. <laughs> You've been a miracle. And we've all seen miracles. The born again miracle is the greatest one of all. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. In closing with this, 2 Chronicles 7:14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. You all know that scripture. Everything we know and everything we do is wrapped up in Jesus, the author 
and finisher of our faith. Jesus is Lord. Everything else is darkness. John, John 1, 4 and 5. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Ephesians 5, 8 and 9. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Righteousness and truth. We came from darkness. We came into the light that Jesus called us into. And now we have to walk in that light and influence others who are in the darkness. Amen. Would you stand? If I was in Canada, I would get arrested probably before I get home. As soon as somebody hears that, calls the police. But it's truth. The truth will prevail. Amen? It's truth. Dear God, we have gathered together here in your name today. We've worshipped you and had communion with you, Lord, and have had these morsels from your word, and we just pray for every person here. And also the ones that aren't here, Lord. Uh, that Christ will reign in everybody that they talk to, that you will empower them to be witnesses for you, Lord. We pray for you know those those who are normally here but not today, Lord, for Dewey and Shirley and Lori, Lord. We pray your blessings on, on them today, Lord. And, uh, just, uh, just fill us all with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and to help us as we go into the world to be the light, Lord, to be the light that you would have shine on the world. And we pray that some would see the light and embrace it. In Jesus' name, amen.